Dr. Dr. Smith has asked me to preach on faith promise. Now, we heard a message on faith promise. We heard a message on the practical aspect of it this morning. Tonight, I'm going to preach more about the actual nuts and bolts of faith promise from the Word of God. As you, get, as you look up the words faith and promise, we know what faith is according to the Word of God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And a promise is a commitment that is made. So it's a commitment that is made based upon something that we can't see yet. Something that we trust that God is going to do. In no passage of the scripture is it more articul better articulated than in the book of Philippians. And we're going to be in the fourth chapter. Dr. Sisk mentioned a little bit about it this morning, but not much, thank goodness. I was worried there for a moment or two. But as you get to this passage of Scripture, let me remind you of what's been going on. Remember, when Paul first came to Macedonia, he went to Philippi. He plants a church there. Who can forget the amazing story of the Philippian jailer and where Paul told him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And this great church begins, this church that is loved the Apostle Paul, this church that is cared for the Apostle Paul, and now... Paul, in prison, is going to be visited by a man by the name of Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus is going to make an 800-mile journey that's going to take seven weeks to get to see the Apostle Paul. He's going to take him some things from the church there at Philippi, and he's going to take, them, take him a monetary gift as well. And we'll get into that here in just a moment. But as Epaphroditus has journeyed for these seven weeks, he's become under the weather, if you will. Paul tells us that he's going to wait for a little while before he goes back. And so while Epaphroditus is recovering from whatever his illness was, Paul is going to write a letter to the church at Philippi. He's going to write a letter thanking them for loving him and expressing to them his love toward them. Remember what he told them in Philippians chapter 1? And you have to picture the setting with me if you don't. Don't mind for just a moment. Epaphroditus is going to return after being gone for 15 or 16 weeks or maybe four months. He's been gone. Everybody in the church would have known that he went to visit the apostle Paul because Paul didn't just preach the gospel to Philippi. Paul introduced the gospel to Philippi. The people in Philippi didn't have a written word of God. They haven't been looking forward to Messiah. They haven't followed the teachings of Jesus going on in Jerusalem. They haven't heard any of the disciples or apostles show up there to preach. So when Paul preaches the gospel to the Philippians, he's preaching it for the first time that they've ever heard it. Consequently, they love the Apostle Paul. And so he begins by telling them how much he loves them. Remember in Philippians chapter 1, I believe it's verses 22 and 23 when he says this, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Can you imagine as Epaphroditus returns and all the people, all the members of the church at Philippi show up because Epaphroditus is bringing a letter directly from the pen of the Apostle Paul and everybody lines the walls of the church as he stands up and you imagine that when he read those words, abiding in the flesh is more needful for you. I don't think there was a dry eye in the place. Don't you think it touched their hearts to hear the Apostle Paul tell them once again how much he loves them. Chapter 2, he cautions them to love each other and to work together as a church. Remember when he says, if there's any bowels and mercies, any consolation in Christ, any, any fellowship of the Spirit, any uh, joints uh, and all of those things, he goes into all that emotion and all that, that service of the Lord. He says, fulfill ye my joy that you may be like-minded, having one mind and one, one desire, and that you're going to look on each other's needs and not on your own things. You're going to serve one another. You're going to have this mind which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery but equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took him under the form of a servant it was made in the likeness of men being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross Amen. therefore <laughs> therefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and of things in earth and of things under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
And in chapter 3, when the Apostle Paul talks about what it was like before he was saved, as we mentioned briefly this morning, uh, saying he was zealous because he persecuted the church, saying he was blameless because he kept the law. And then he says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Paul tells them from that moment on, everything was different. Everything was different from that Damascus road. And no longer does he have any confidence in the flesh. But then when you get to chapter 4, you find the thank you note portion of the book of Philippians. He loves this church. He cares for this church. He's taught this church. Very little negative said to the church at Philippi. But in chapter 4, as he's writing it up, he uses the last paragraph and a half to tell the church how thankful he is and to teach us a lesson almost 2,000 years later about faith promise missions look if you will Philippians chapter 4 we're going to begin reading in verse 10 Philippians chapter 4 and verse 10 but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again wherein you are also careful but you lacked opportunity not that I speak in respect of want for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content for I know both how to be abased and how to know how I know how to abound Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to uh, abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with me, with my affliction. Interesting word, communicate, because Paul's going to turn around and tell us what he really means by communicate. Ye did communicate with me, uh, did communicate with my affliction. Now, ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, But I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full. Having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever. And ever, amen. I would want to preach tonight a short, simple message entitled The Promise of Faith Promise. The Promise of Faith Promise right here from Philippians chapter 4. Let's have a word of prayer. And I realize before we pray that you've already filled out your faith promise cards. I realize you've already bathed that in prayer. But I'm certain, I, 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 would, I would actually say I would guarantee... That if someone in this auditorium tonight sat there under the preaching of the word of God and almighty God got a hold of your heart and you decided that you wanted to double your faith promise uh, commitment card. That if you came to pastor and said, pastor, I want to double that faith promise card. I don't think he would say, oh, no, no, you can't do that. I think you would gladly accept that. But if you just continue to pray about this thing of faith promise. And by the way, it's not what you put on a card. If the Lord opens up the windows of heaven and pours out a blessing on you, there's not a single problem with you making sure that it goes to some place around the world for the preaching of the gospel. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for our time once again in your house. Lord, I pray that you bless the message tonight. Have your will in your way. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to notice first the pattern of faith promise. The pattern of faith promise. The first thing you notice when you read this passage of Scripture that Paul is content. Paul is not writing a letter to the church at Philippi asking for money all the time. Now, please understand, it sometimes is necessary for a missionary to say, hey, we've got this project. We need to buy a van. We need to build a building. We need to expand our ministry, and we don't have the money to do so over here in wherever we are in Senegal, Africa, or, or, in, uh, uh, or in St. Lucia, or wherever the case may be. Sometimes it's necessary, but your pastor, although he would never say so because he's more gracious than I am. There's a reason I'm an evangelist. I would not handle being a pastor very well. I'm certain that your pastor gets some letters from some missionaries and when he looks at the envelope and he sees who it's from, he knows that in there is going to be a long list of monetary requests. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with doing that on occasion, but if you're doing it every single time, either God doesn't know what you need or you're just not trusting God one way or the other. 
But the truth of the matter is, Paul doesn't ask for a thing. He says, I'm happy if I am full. I'm happy if I'm empty. I'm happy if I abound. I'm happy if I'm abased. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And please, don't think that's talking about something physical. You'll hear a 350-pound youth director wearing skinny jeans say this. Well, if, if, if I needed to, I could run a marathon tonight because I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Listen, if you can't walk to the mailbox and back without getting winded, you're not going to run a marathon. That's not what it's talking about. It's not saying you can fly. It's not saying that you could run a 100-meter dash in under nine seconds. It's saying you can be a base and you can be a bound. A bound. You can be full. You can suffer want. You can have a full checkbook. You can have an empty checkbook because you can be content in all of those things. And that's what Paul is saying here. Paul is in prison here. Paul is locked up here, not because he violated the law of the land, but because he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here we find Paul in prison, and even in prison, Paul says, I'm content. I'm happy to be poor. I'm happy if I'm rich. I'm happy if I'm full, and I'm happy if I'm hungry. It starts out, the plan of faith promise starts out with a content missionary. And did you notice that this morning? And because I noticed it, and I'm sure, I'm sure most of you did, I don't know that any one of the missionary presentations that we heard this morning, I didn't hear one single one of those people mention one specific need that they needed you to write them a check about. Did you notice that? They wanted you to pray for them. They wanted you to love them. They wanted you to know what they're doing there, and we'll get into that a little bit more, but not, not, they were content, just like the Apostle Paul is content. The Bible tells us to be content, doesn't it? In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Or 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 8, and having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Or Hebrews 13 and verse 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Contentment is an important thing. And Paul was content. Secondly, though, not just was Paul content on the, uh, the pattern of faith promise, but Philippi was caring. He said, your care has flourished once and again. This isn't talking about money, or I don't think it is. Paul uses a different word when he talks about money here in a moment. But the simple fact is this church cared for the apostle Paul. This church loved the apostle Paul, and the apostle Paul loved them. I tell you what missionaries want more than anything. And let's, let's make sure we just, we're talking the nuts and bolts tonight. Remember that. Missionaries do appreciate the fact that your church supports them financially. But if you gave most godly missionaries the choice with whether they could have your financial support or they could know that an entire church in Taze Valley, West Virginia was praying for them, I think almost every one of them would choose the prayer over the money. And once again, we're going to be completely frank. They'd like to have the prayer and the money. One of those missionaries needs to say amen. You need to say amen loud, brother, right there. But the truth of the matter is they cared for the apostle Paul. They cared for him when he left. They cared for him while he was there. They continually cared for the apostle Paul. See, Paul was content and Philippi was caring, but Philippi was also communicating. I love the use of the word communicating here. Paul's talking about giving. One thing we have a problem with in independent fundamental Bible, even Baptist churches, and the only time that we don't have as much a problem about it is during missions conference, but we don't like to talk about money. It's When a pastor gets up and starts preaching on tithing, eventually someone in the auditorium is going to sit there and think, I guess he needs a raise. Someone is going to be under the impression that something must be going on or wouldn't be preaching on tithing or giving or offerings. Understand, please, those things are in the Word of God, and the Bible tells us to preach all the counsel of God. But the simple truth is Paul did not struggle with any kind of problem with talking about money. In one of the, one of the most often quoted passages of Scripture as Paul is writing about the rapture of the church. Remember what he said to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 beginning in verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed. In a moment, at the twink of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. You know what you just want to start doing whenever you start reading that? You want to start saying amen just a little bit. And this corruptible must put an incorruption. And this mortal 
must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what, you know what is going on right there at the church at Corinth? Some people have already stood up. They've reached out, and they've grabbed their handkerchief. They're waving it in the air. They're saying amen. They're saying hallelujah. And all of a sudden, Paul says, and while you're standing, get your wallet out. You know what it says next? Now. Concerning the collection. Paul doesn't say, well, I really hate to bring this up. and I know it's an uncomfortable topic, but uh, no. Paul included it in a conversation about the rapture of the church. Listen, Christian, we ought not to be afraid of the topic of communicating, especially when it comes to our missionaries. Paul talks about communicating. He says they're giving and they're receiving. And they've done it multiple times. Don't you love that? They gave once and again to his need when he was in Thessalonica. Now they've given again while he's in prison. And I love how Paul mentioned it. Dr. Sis mentioned it briefly this morning. They were the only ones. Don't you think the church at Iconium and the church at Lystra and the church at Derbe and the church at Thyatira that they all wanted to give to the apostle Paul but they all thought the same thing. Well, I'm sure someone else is doing it. You know, Paul, doesn't, uh, Paul writes the church at Philippi a letter and says, thank you for giving. I, I, even though he was content to be rich or poor, but I didn't see him write a letter to Iconium saying, thank you for making me poor. I appreciate that. What I'm saying is this. I'm sure lots of other churches thought that someone else was supporting the Apostle Paul. But there needs, some be, some, needs to be some churches like Tays Valley. And like Philippi that say, we're going to step up and we're going to communicate whether anybody else communicates or not. We're going to give whether anybody else does or not. We're going to give in such an extravagant way that God is going to bless us for doing so. You've never single one time, never one time in your entire life heard of a church that gave extravagantly to missions that was struggling to pay the bills. It doesn't exist. Notice, number one, there's the pattern of faith promise that Paul was content, Philippi was caring, and Philippi was communicating. Number two, the purpose of faith promise. Paul tells us why we support missions in this passage of Scripture. Now, I noticed this morning that our project this year here at Tays Valley is the food pantry. But did you notice this? Every single time your pastor referred to the project of the food pantry this year, he referred to it as a way to give out the gospel. Because everything that we do in a New Testament church, just like that video we just saw just a moment ago, everything ought to be based upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't that what Paul says in verse 15? Notice what he says, please. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me. Why did Philippi uh, support the apostle Paul? Because he preached the gospel. See, understand this. I'm fine if you want to go to another country and give hungry people some food. I am fine if you want to give thirsty people some water. I'm fine if you want to give naked people some clothes. I'm fine if you want to give some homeless people some houses. But that's not the goal of missions in a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. See, we're fine with giving them food as long as we first give them the bread of life. We're fine with giving them some water as long as we first give them the spring of living water so that they're never thirsty again. We're fine with clothing those that have no clothes as long as we've robed them in a robe of righteousness first. We're fine with building them a home just as long as we get make sure they've got a mansion to go to when they die. What I'm here to say is Philippi did not support the Apostle Paul because he was socially benefiting everybody. They supported him because it's the beginning of the gospel. Paul preached the gospel every place he went. The Bible is clear about it. As you follow the Apostle Paul through the book of Acts, you see in chapter 16 and verse 10, after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go to Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Or in Ephesus, Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, but none of these things move me, neither count on my life dear unto myself that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel 
of the grace of God. Or to Rome in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew and also to the Greek. Galatians, how about the church of Galatia? Galatians chapter 4 and verse 13. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preach the gospel unto you at the first. Or to Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 15. For our gospel came not unto you in word only but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. The fact of the matter is they knew exactly what Paul was going to preach because Paul was going to preach the gospel. That's why we have missionaries come. That's why we have missionaries stand up and present their works. Not so that the church at Taze Valley can see whether their kids are well behaved or not. Although we notice that sometimes. Some missionaries that we've known over the years... Uh, have, have some of the most well-behaved children that you've ever met in your life. The McKittricks, brother, uh, brother Sisk would know Danny McKittrick. He's in Yakota. They have three boys and a little girl. The boys are Titus, uh, Silas, and Asa in that order. No, Ty- Titus, Asa, and Silas in that order. A few years ago, when Titus was 10 and Asa was 8, they were both taking karate in Japan. And as they're taking karate, Ace's team did better than Titus's team. Titus, being the older brother, was very embarrassed. The dojo had been divided up into multiple teams. And so Titus's team had come in 15th place, whereas Ace's team had come in fourth place. And so the younger brother was making fun of the older brother, mocking him because his team did so poorly, even though they were older. Finally, Danny set the law down. We were sitting at their house, and we have dinner in front of us on the table. And Danny's, uh, uh, Titus is crying because his little brother is making fun of him. And Danny brings the hammer down. He says, that's enough. He said, Asa, listen, listen carefully. I don't want you to pick on your brother anymore about the karate tournament. About 10 minutes later, as we're getting ready to eat, Danny says, Asa, why don't you go ahead and ask the Lord's blessing? Asa bowed his head and said, Dear Lord, we thank you for the food. We thank you that the Harpers are here. Lord, I want to take a moment and ask that you bless my brother because his team came in 15th place. (laughs) And Lord, I want to thank you so much that you gave me and my team the strength to come in fourth place. I'm doing the old-fashioned comedic spit take as I'm sitting there at the table. I cannot stop laughing. I'm trying to figure out how any dad can handle that little problem right there. How do you tell your son, don't you ever pray for your brother again? You can't do that. How, and don't, don't you ever thank the Lord for giving you this uh, success in something. You can't say that either. It was one of the smartest things I've ever seen. And their boys are a testimony to them, but that's not why we would support Danny McKittrick. We're not going to support him because their kids are sharp. They can quote 17 books of the Bible and they can read Hebrew. We don't support them for that. We support them because they're going to preach the gospel. That's all we're interested in. Everything else is additional and it's fine as long as that is the primary thing. And by the way, I will say that one more time. I hate to keep referring to it, but did you notice in that video that Brother Sis just had us watch just a few minutes ago how many times he said that everything was about the gospel? Notice carefully, please. It's not just the gospel, it's the going, isn't it? Paul was leaving Macedonia. What does he say at the beginning of the gospel? When I departed from Macedonia. (laughs) You gave when I left. You gave when I was in Thessalonica. You gave to me while I was in prison. You just keep giving and giving and giving because I'm going where you can't go. And we mentioned that briefly this morning in that five-minute thing after Sunday school, at the end of Sunday school. You and I can't go into all the world and preach the gospel. The Philippians were building their Jerusalem. They were witnessing in their Jerusalem. And how many things, by the way, let me just take a moment and compliment Taze Valley Baptist Church. How many times have I seen on Facebook, as I, I follow you, and getting, I've gotten emails about all the uh, boys and girls that have been saved uh, on your, on your uh, it's not country roads, is it? It's, it's highways and hedges and highways and hedges. There's always something on your uh, being posted somewhere about people being saved in the jail ministry. And your church is concentrating on your Jerusalem at the same time, you're focusing on the uttermost parts of the earth. The simple truth is, Paul was going where they couldn't go. 
They weren't going to all those churches we listed. They weren't going to plant churches all over Asia Minor and ordain them elders and commend them to the Spirit. No, no. They were, Paul was doing what they could not, and so they supported Paul in doing it. See, number one, there's the pattern of faith promised that Paul was content. The church Philippi was caring and Philippi was communicating. Number two, we saw the purpose of faith promise. It's the gospel and it's the going. That's why we support. That's why we give in faith promise. That's why we give in missions. Number three, though, the priority of faith promise. The finances. What does Paul say as he's wrapping everything up in verse 18? But I have all. Let me ask you a question. Think about this for just a second with me. Let's not read the Bible as if it's a textbook. Let's read this as if it's an actual letter to the church at Philippi. These people that love the Apostle Paul that much. What do you think it did to their hearts when he said, I have all. I abound having received of Epaphroditus. Paul's needs are met. The missionary is overflowing with joy, overflowing with satisfaction. He's abounding. That means good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. We do not know how much the church at Philippi gave the Apostle Paul. It might have been a very meager two mites for all we know. But it was enough to make Paul abound. It's enough that that church was able to tell Paul how much they love him that they were able to tangibly communicate how much he meant to them. Notice, please, the priority is the finances, but also the fruit. I mentioned earlier that Paul did not ask for anything. But as, as I echo one other thing that Brother Sisk said this morning, the Apostle Paul does ask for one thing. Not as though I desire a gift. But as I, I desire fruit. That it may abound to your account. Paul, the only thing Paul asked for was something for Philippi. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Do you realize that? Can you imagine the next time there's a video presentation from Sangala that they're reading the texts and everything that they've received like they did in that video? And one of the people that says, I now know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, trusted Christ because a transmitter was provided by Tays Valley Baptist Church or an auditorium was completed through a, a generous gift from your church. Could you imagine that a church is planted in Mexico and hundreds and maybe even thousands of Mexicans come to know Christ as their personal Savior and that fruit abounds to your account? You're not going to Mexico. You're not going to St. Lucia. You're not going to Nigeria. But the fruit can be in your account. How did Paul word that at the beginning of the book of Corinthians? I planted. I'm not a Paul. Apollos watered. I'm not an Apollos. God gave the increase. And you want to add it? To, you want to finish that sentence? And the fruit's in your account. Tays Valley. The, the whole purpose of faith promise is the finances of the missionary and the fruit in our account. So we saw, number one, the pattern of faith promise. Paul was content, Philippi was caring, and Philippi was communicating. The purpose of faith promise is the gospel and the going. The priority of faith promise is the finances and the fruit. But last and we finish, the promise of faith promise. Notice what he says. Paul says, I abound. I have all. I'm full. I've received of Epaphroditus. Let's read it exactly as he says it. But I have all and abound and am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. Paul's fine. Paul's doing great. And listen, Christian, if you truly care about a missionary and you read a letter that says, praise the Lord, we were able to buy that new church van. I remember several years ago, a missionary that we know very well, the Gossets in Trinidad, they sent out a little letter, said we're trying to buy a church van, we need another church van here in Trinidad. And several churches got together and sent some money in for it. Do you know I personally have seen probably 400 boys and girls get off of those vans in Trinidad. I've seen hundreds of them come to know Christ as their personal Savior. And what a joy it is for each of those churches that gave to that as they read the letters about all that the Lord has done through the van ministry. 
It's an encouraging thing to know that the missionary abounds. If you care for the missionary as you're supposed to and you read a letter that he says, I'm full, I abound, I got it, it's wonderful. That's an encouraging thing, isn't it? But it's not just about Paul being full. Watch what he says next because this is even bigger than Paul being full. Notice, having received uh, uh, those things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell. Paul's not describing that they sprayed perfume on the letter they sent him. This is talking about a sacrifice, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice, acceptable. Now, if you stop there, it sounds like they're giving a sacrifice to the apostle Paul. But that's not what it says. Well-pleasing to God. Sometimes I fear we don't understand what mission, mission giving really is. Mission giving is not me giving to a missionary. It's me giving to God. When you put that faith promise gift into the offering every single week for the next 52 weeks, you're giving it to God. It's going to end up in the hands of a missionary. Now watch this. I give it to God. God is pleased. It's a sweet-smelling savor rising up into the nostrils of the almighty God of heaven. At the same time, with the same gift, the missionary is full. He abounds. He's received it. But that's not even the best part. Not only has it made Paul abound, not only has it pleased God, but lastly, this is another verse that Brother Sisk hinted at this morning, but my God shall supply, replace all the surplus in your checking account according to his riches in glory. That's what it says, isn't it? This church at Philippi has given so much. We don't know, again, we don't know how much. We don't know if it's a wealthy church or a poor church. Most likely it's a poor church. But whatever they gave to Paul was more than they could afford to give to Paul. Faith promise is not sitting down and adding up your budget and saying at the end of the month, I have $50 left over that I can spend. So I'm going to put $12.50 per week into faith promise. That's not what it is. Faith promise is me saying, even if it creates a need, I'm putting this much in because I'm going to step out. And see the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. I can't add it up so that it works out. If I give what I put down on that faith promise card. If I take that and add a little bit more to it. Or whatever I do. If I take that. I'm going to be in the red at the end of the month. I might not have enough to do what I want to do. I might have to miss a night out. I might have to miss this. If I do what I said on there. But I'm going to put it down anyway. I'm going to promise God. I'm going to give this and just step out by faith and trust him to supply all my need it's amazing too because you've heard story after story after story and will be done of people who have given money to missions they gave money they couldn't afford to give and at the end of the year they had twice as much money to give as they did when they started because it is it is an impossible task trust me it's an impossible task to outgive God It's an impossible task with your finite riches to give so much to the Lord that he wonders in heaven how he's going to repay you. Oh, no. Uh, Brother Estep gave $1,000 in missions giving. I really should pay him back, but I don't know where my money is going to... Oh, that's gold. I forgot. You're not going to outgive God? Listen, Christian. You give to God. The church is going to make sure it ends up in the hands of the missionaries. They're going to be full and abound and content. And then watch every month as God performs a miracle and supplies all your need according to his riches and glory. I've never heard in all my years in ministry, and your pastor's been in it longer than I have, and Brother Sisk has been in the uh, the ministry longer than both of us put together. I think he was talking about learning about faith promise in 1968. I was five. But not one of us can stand up and tell you one story about someone who gave in faith promise that ended up going broke because of it. Not one. But we can tell you about people getting saved in Japan, in Germany, in Uruguay, 
in Trinidad. We can tell you about people getting saved in Nigeria and in Mexico and in Senegal. And we can tell you story after story about people getting saved in Grenada and people getting saved in St. Lucia. Because here's what happens. You give even though it creates a need. God blesses and refills your coffers. At the same time, the missionary is content and abounds. And Almighty God on the throne of heaven is pleased. There is no better investment plan than giving faith promise missions. I would love it. Now, this verse, this passage is all about giving to faith promise, giving to missions. And Brother Sisk, I have looked all through the Word of God to try to find one verse, just one verse in the Bible that promises a great promise for giving to an evangelist. I cannot find one. I don't think it exists in there. If it were, I would preach it every week. No, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't. But I'm here to tell you something, Christian. Make sure you pray about that number you put down on that faith promise card. Maybe God's going to lay on your heart to step out just that much more by faith. And maybe next year when you take on five missionaries or ten missionaries or twenty missionaries... Maybe next year when you have 20 countries that you've never supported before. Now, on your list of missionaries, you can sit there and take a little bit of ownership, can't you? Don't you think the people at Philippi, when they read that, my God should supply all your need. Don't you think there have been some anxious moments for the last four months as they've been waiting for Epaphroditus to get back? And then they read Paul say, it's going to be fine. I bet there's some people in Philippi went, Phew. glad to know that. And listen, Christian, it's going to be fine. Whatever the Lord lays on your heart to give in faith promise, he will not leave you high and dry. He'll be pleased. The missionary will be full and your need will be met every single time. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes as pastor's going to come.